Hello everyone! Welcome to Night 11, Book 2, Night 11 uh, of the Orphan's Tales Live Quarantine Reading Series and I am telling you what, it has been a day. I hate people, all of them, you guys accepted, obviously, uh, but other than that I hate humans, uh, Americans specifically, uh, but humans probably in general. I don't actually think this is exclusive to us in any way. Uh, I just think we drew a real bad straw or voted for the straw in some of our cases uh, as far as leadership goes and so our leadership told everyone it was okay to act the way humans just kind of generally want to act uh, and nobody else's did that. So uh, but yeah so I was in town today uh, and I got to see everyone walking around as um, hetero couples where the woman's wearing a mask and the man isn't and you know they had a fight about it before they left the house because they're both stink face you can see her stink face under the mask uh, and that's just everyone this this like 60 year old guy in active wear and like <laughs> beats by Dre on his ears just like walked by going ah with no mask on to everybody in the giant car line. I've lived here for 12 years. I have never been in a car line as long as that to get back onto the uh, island after my once every six weeks shopping. Uh, it was just absurd. I like I was lined up. Um, there's a giant building with like somebody painted whales on it in the 70s and I was like all the way over by that. Uh, and we're supposed to have less people this summer because of the plague and apparently we don't we don't have any less people and they're all jerks and uh i just um I, my, my level of annoyance with human beings is just so so high and i just I'm, i was i was watching everyone all the people without masks and thinking huh i wonder if the reason that uh they get so mad about other people wearing masks because like i can kind of i don't know I used to be into conspiracy theories. I can kind of understand their idiocy about not wanting to wear it themselves. If I didn't, we had somebody on next door ranting and raving last night about how he won't be led to the slaughter by wearing a mask. I don't even know what that means. Um, I asked, he did not elaborate. Uh, but I wonder if the reason they get so upset about other people wearing masks, which doesn't affect them at all. Um, for a while I thought it must be because they just want to pretend it's not real. But they don't because they watch Fox News. Like they don't want to pretend it's not real. I feel like it's because all of a sudden they can't pass as like a normal kind human being. Uh, like they, they, they're, in order to do what they want to do, they have to out themselves as an asshole to everybody. And so people give them the stink eye uh, in, the, in a way that they never did before because you can't tell who voted for that man uh just by looking at them but you can now uh and i feel like they really resent that they can no longer like pass in polite society as a member of polite society that like uh pursuing their their little fantasy uh actually uh, reveals them uh well <laughs> welcome out of the closet boys uh we can see you so um that's how i feel tonight. You can see the manic energy of hating the universe on my face uh, and I cover it with a smile because my face when I'm like my genuine face of being annoyed at the universe is terrifying. Uh, so I smile the most when I'm when I'm mm, nuke us from orbit it's the only way to be sure. <sighs> yeah. All right let's read some fairy tales. Uh, about people who are, you know, only only slightly worse than those who don't wear masks. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, someone said no one wears masks around here. I don't think they're all Trump voters. Um, yeah, but like, there's a mix of Trump voters and like, there's people on the left too who are like the whole anti-vax and like don't listen to the government. Like, there, there's there's a whole mess on that side too. Uh, and like, nobody can hide anymore. You've staked your claim uh, by wearing a mask or not. I think they just don't like to be uh, seen. What am I drinking? I am drinking sparkling wine with mango something in it from Trader Joe's. Um, also, Trader Joe's <laughs> kept half my groceries. I was so, I, you know, I get so tired and I like, I was in, the, in there this morning shopping and they like, make you stay far away while they do all your groceries. And then they handed me the cart and I walked out and I got in my car. I didn't think about it. And then I got home and I'm like, all my stuff's missing. 
uh, so, and they had not loaded it into my cart, but they put it on the ferry for me, which was very nice, and gave me a free chocolate bar and some stickers, uh, which did go some way to allowing me to discuss today's events with a smile. Uh, and I got sparkly wine with mango stuff in it. Uh, and it's very good. And I like Trader Joe's, and I'm glad that we have one in our town. When I first moved here, we didn't have one. Um, yeah, okay, well, let's do, <laughs> let's do the intro. Uh, the lipstick tonight, before I forget, because it has a lot of words in it, is Mega Last Liquid Catsuit in Give Me Mocha. Now, this is about two ninety nine. dollars so if you like this lipstick and it stays on forever, I will have this on in the morning, uh, you can have it for virtually no money. Um, and that's my commercial for Mega Last, whatever that is. Uh, yeah, all right, so, intros, okay. As always, this is not an audiobook of The Orphan's Tales. This is a one-woman show. Uh, you can find music based on these books at sjtucker.com. You can buy copies of them at your local independent booksellers. Uh, they all have web portals. They would all appreciate your business very much right now. Uh, if you would like to support mine, it is printbookstore.com out of Portland, Maine. You can find me ranting and raving and occasionally telling jokes uh, and occasionally being heartfelt, but these days the heartfelt is usually angry, uh, on Twitter at Kat Valenti. Uh, you can find me on Patreon at Kat Valenti as well, where there is a huge essay up with way too many feelings about Miss Piggy, uh, right now, but I highly recommend it. I'm actually kind of proud of it as a piece of writing. Um, you can catch up in the archive. Uh, I was a little late, but it is complete at the moment, uh, at YouTube at Kat Valenti Live. Um, you can ask me questions after the reading if you are inclined to do so if you want to ask anything but it works best if you think of what you want to ask while i'm reading so that we don't have any dead air while i awkwardly sip my mango stuff and uh we wait for someone to ask something um and if you would like to toss a coin to your witch as always uh there's a tip jar on my instagram profile on my youtube profile and my website which is katherinemvalenti.com remember that Catherine is spelled funny um these are totally free. You don't have to, but it is quite a lot to uh, do this little <laughs> mini television studio in my house uh, twice a week, and uh, times are very tight uh, for writers and freelancers of all kinds right now, so anything that you can toss into the witch's hat is deeply appreciated. Thank you so much to Dave uh, for tipping me last week. Uh, you are awesome, and uh, I deeply, deeply can't really thank you enough. It's amazing. And anyone else who puts anything in there, I will thank you by name on the next stream. Okay. Uh, ask me after, Jen. Let's get ready to rumble, sparkle. I don't know. It's not very sparkly tonight. Um, oh, here comes Byron. So look out. There is a large cat looking to have a cameo here. If you spill my drink, Byron, it's over between us. Uh, okay, so we are on page 199, if you are following along at home. I trimmed my bangs so I could see you guys better, but I don't really think it's helping. Um, okay, here we go. The tale of the crossing continued. Seven stepped off the dock onto the wet beach. Idle was already punting away from him, the flash of lizard tails peeking out from his cloak every now and then. The young man walked up the shoreline, gingerly trying not to look down, for the beach was strewn not with grey pebbles as it had seemed when he saw it from the lake, but with thousands of closed eyelids, glistening silver and wet, which opened wherever he stepped, their irises pale and accusing. They wept constantly, and their tears mingled with the lake foam in salty waves. He clutched his empty sleeve and did not look down, though his stomach lurched with each wet and yielding step. He was relieved when the coast of eyes gave way to the gray loam and skeleton leaves, and the forest spiked up around him, bare and thin branched, birches and larches and gnarled oaks with no leaves clattering in the lackluster wind. But he did not know how to find her. He wandered in the wood and no bird called, no deer chewed acorns, no mouse scurried past. There was no sun and he could not tell where he went, but he went on. He was frozen and numb with a damp that crawled over him like a pair of lizards. What have you done now, you silly old cripple? The voice came from nowhere. The wood wound ahead of him, 
in its patches of gray and white, empty and still. But he knew the voice. Oh, how he knew it. Oubliette, where are you? He whispered. Out of the trees, an old twisted ash turned around, and it was his Oubliette, her hair brown and fog plastered to her neck. Her eyes wide and sad, her dress, what was left of it, pale and clinging. He ran to her, who would not have run. He ran to her and she put her arms around his neck, her brow on his mangled shoulder. Why did you come after me? How will you get back, you stupid boy? She said ruefully, shaking her head against him. I came to save you, he said, surprised and confused. It's what we do, isn't it? We save each other. Oubliette pushed him away. I didn't need you to save me. Do you know what it cost me to get here? Do you know what it cost me to follow you? Seven exploded. She turned again on her heels and her tree side whipped around, pitted and petrified and smooth, no tail at all. He had not seen her because she was all tree now, her sweet tufted cow tail gone. I paid him in flesh, the ferryman and his awful lizards. I assume you did too. He spent the last of our day but to get here, to save me. Not the last. Oubliette's eyes blazed, her skin suddenly less than grey, flushed with anger. She threw herself against him, almost knocking him to the forest floor, and kissed him with such ferocity and brutal strength that he could not breathe. Her mouth was hot in the freeze and fog, her teeth cracking against his. She drew blood from his lip and tore away, her mouth still stained with his, scarlet in the grey. That's what she wanted, wasn't it? The grateful kiss of a rescued maiden. Her pretty hand in yours, the doe eyes batting stupidly at you, just like a miller's son. No, no, Oubliette, I never wanted you like that. You know that. <laughs> well, why not? She laughed, desperate and shrill. Seven looked at her, his eyes full of tears, his back bent and broken, his sleeve dangling. There are some things you never get over, he whispered. What do you see when you look at me? Tell me what you see. Tell me you see a man. Tell me. Oubliette cringed, her mouth twisting into an ugly grimace. She was so much older now, he saw. Her jaw was hard and sharp, her face her own entirely without the smallest hint of a child haunting it. Bone, she hissed. I look at you and I see bones. Bones and coins. I know. Seven reached for her again, and she let herself be held, shaking like a caught deer. You saved me, my friend, my only friend. I had to save you. I had to. I chose to come here. I wanted to come. I went to the lake. I know. I went too. Did you see her? Yes, she was beautiful. It's so beautiful, and her face was so dark. Were you scared? No. Well, yes. Were you? Of course. Did you do it? I had to. Did you? Yes. Did you throw up? No, but I wanted to. When she cut me to fill her bowl, all that red, it was like before. Yes. The two looked at each other, half smiling. Do you want to talk about it? Seven said against her wild smelling hair. Not really. She snorted, wiping her eyes. What is one entrance to the underworld? It's always the same, the blood and the hooded lady in the cave. You give what you can, you go into the dark. The dark took us. No more needs to be said. But there's always more. Tell me, like you used to, when I warmed your bark with my belly and you kept your hair so short. You were always tiresome and greedy, Oubliette sighed, but she was smiling a little. I went to the lake. The tale of the dancing girl's descent. Taglio kept his absentia in a little box, too. Did he tell you that? He showed me once. He wept over them, shriveled and black, knocking in an orange wood box like the rattle in a snake's tail. He wanted me to see them because I am a Haldra. And so, in some roundabout sense, he had mutilated himself for me. For my grandmother's, for my celestial aunt. I wrinkled my nose. It is embarrassing to witness another person's faith laid out like that reduced to something small and dry and lifeless, a reliquary full of toenail clippings. 
I think he always liked me better than you. He'd never met a real Huldra. We were abstract. The story of the heifer star and her brother was real. I was proof of his religion. I was as good as a star, and I slept against his stomach between the card handles. He looked at me and told himself that he was right, that the dull phantom ache between his legs was sacred. I don't know anything about that. I'm only myself. I've always been made of wood and girl and cow, and that is no more a divine revelation to me than a man's thumbs are to him. You never thought I was proof of the existence of God. But I felt sorry for our green gazelle. Do you remember his little cape? And I let him tell, him, tell me I was holy. It seemed the least I could do. We hunted together while the manticore taught you to pick pockets and sing scales. He was so quick with those teeth and I became as quick as he. It was so hard to stay by you. I looked at you and shivered as though the hollow walls of the mint were still all around me. I looked at you and I knew I shouldn't have taken the burden. I should have lain under the stamp. It was my idea. It was wrong of me to let you do it. I looked at you and remembered everything. The taglio singing little rhymes to the rabbits until they were close enough to snatch. I could forget. And I forgot when I danced, when I was Zemea, when I was beautiful and strong and immune to all hedgehogs. When I was Zemea, I could not be touched. I did not have to be a tree girl who had lost a kiss to the miller's son or her hair to a unicorn or seven years to a factory. I was her. I was green and I writhed. And the music became quicker as you joined in with Taglio and played his little flute. I understood less and less that I was not her. On the hunt, he called me holy. In the dance, I knew I was divine. If it seems silly now, at least I have the consolation that many others had gone before me in madness for love of her, for love of the snake and the sky. I cannot explain it better. I danced her so often that I felt her in me. I felt her far off in the dark, coiling around herself in the fog. What damage does the telling of a story play upon its teller? I told her story hundreds of times. I could not bear to remain outside it. The day after you kissed me, I was not angry. I don't, I don't think I was. I never thought of it again. Taglio and I went after supper. We were on the track of a fawn. I lay on my belly in the moss and the birch leaves and watched its spots flash in and out of the wood. He lay beside me. And we whispered to each other while our prey chewed twigs. You look like a snake lying there. I'm sure it is not an accident. And I am sure you are about to leave us. He hissed accusingly. Why would you say that? barely here. I almost see through you. You would speak to no one and only dance if you did not like to hunt so well, if you did not like me so well. And I have begun to wonder if you do not like me only because I once saw her. I turned my head slowly so as not to start the deer. Don't say that. You are my cart knight. For now, but you left us days ago. I felt you go. Now there is only this stranger in your place lying to me and telling me she is you. I looked at the mash of old broken forest beneath me. You do not want me to stay. That's why you say such awful things. With equal slowness, he cupped my head in his hand. Darling Haltra, full born and born by me uh, to a fortunate wind. I will not be the one who keeps you, and we will soldier on without your moods and your scowls, much as we love them. Find whatever you are already looking for. I will go, I mumbled, to the Isle of the Dead, and do what you could not. He blinked, as though I had cut into him with my hunting knife. I saw his lip tremble in anger or grief or hope. A long while passed, and we did not mark the fawn at all, but wrestled in our gazes. Finally, he drew from his vest a little brown box and drew from it a silver black leaf. Don't fail us, he said. And as one, with the leaf clutched in my hand, we sprang out of the brush and took the fawn down in one single red stroke. How do you
do you find the land of the dead without dying? Everyone has a story of that place. It is grey and lonely. It is a raucous circus. It is a place of judgment where the soul is weighed against a feather. It is nothing at all. I do not care, little girl. Go away. Don't steal milk from my cow. You could ask a thousand folk and hear a thousand tales. Or you could go to an astrologer and by turning your back, amaze him into drawing you a map to an almond tree, which is almost a legend, but when in actuality, which is in actuality your petrified, mistletoe-infested grandfather, and tell him that if he does not tell you the way, you will cut him right down and not even weep. For he, wouldn't, he should never have touched your grandmother at all. You could brandish an axe to make your point. It would have to be a very sharp one. The tree might ask how he would know the way. And you might say that he is neither living nor dead, being mostly absentia and almonds, and surely able to tell you how to slip into the in-between places. The tree might grumble, but only one or two swings of the axe, only one or two showers of wood chips, would probably induce him to shout and wail and holler out just exactly how to find a lake with a woman living near it, at the mouth of a cave. The tree who is some part of your grandfather might then whip his branches around to try to catch you, slapping at your arms. But it is too awful to think about. And you would get away as quickly as you could. I would certainly never tell anyone about it. There is a lake here. There is a lake there. It does not seem much like any other lake, save that its beach is littered with thin slivers of glass like raindrops. Over that sharp shore I walked with my good solid shoes well bought and my steps echoed across the water like shouts. So I should not be surprised that she was awake and waiting for me, a black cowl drawn over her face, so that I could only see a long hoopoe's beak, long and thin and curved, pointing out at me. Her black skirts spread out over the ground in drooping folds on and on down the beach and into the black water, and it seemed to me that there was no difference between the cloth and the lake. Let me pass, I said. Pass what? She said, and her voice seemed hollow in that clacking beak. Pass through you to the land of the dead. And here we have a lovely illustration by Michael Kaluda. You may try to pass through me. But you will find I am very thick, made more or less of bone and meat, and therefore I am afraid you will find it tough going. I blinked at her, but she threw off her hood, revealing a middle-aged woman, neither thin nor fat, with the beginnings of grey hair creeping through brown, and skin like an old blasted oak. Her eyes were narrow and dark. She reached behind her head and loosed a clasp, pulling the beak away from her face. She was only a woman with a mouth and a nose and teeth like any other. Didn't you like my joke? She laughed. One doesn't get many opportunities to chat in my line of work. The least you could do is chuckle a little, maybe even giggle. Don't girls still giggle out there in the world? I'm out of practice, I grunted. So my dear, maybe it's not a very good joke. What do I have to do to get through? I'm afraid I was very short with her. Perhaps you did better, she sighed. You might listen instead of talking so much. The mourner's tale. I occupy a strange profession. It was only slightly stranger than my previous employment. I was once a mourner by trade, an avocation which harpies take particularly well to, having a screech like no other creature. Did I forget to mention? Well, don't look under the cloak. We know what a lament is better than any who walks on five toes. When we are required, we live with a corpse for weeks on end. We live, in our, we live with our lament until it has shape and heft, until it has the weight of the corpse, and in the putrefying gases we detect the virtue or the degeneracy of the subject. Decomposition does not lie. We lament not when we are told to, but when the lament is finished, be it days or years hence. 
when we can hold its hand and walk down the street of a city showing it the grocers where the deceased bought her carrots and turnips, the butcher where she cut her meat and in secret met her lover, the gallery where just once a portrait of her hung, then the lament is grown and done. It nods sadly and passes through all these places to the grave, where we screech and sing and tear out our hair, where we rend our breasts and howl grief into the ground. Once in Ursel, which is poor and sad in all things save retired soldiers with broken swords and useless plowshares, we took 15 years to rear the lament of a certain general. We walked it through the shanties and the porches where old officers told their bloody tales to the wind, and they followed behind, falling in like ranks to hear how the old man was mourned. It is necessary work. I was good at it. I suppose that's what got me here. One cannot, among the mourning harpies, be truly considered adept without the hoopoe's beak. We can crow and keen and split your ears into bloody halves with the anguish in our throats, but not all of a lament is sorrow. Even in the old general's scar life, there was sweetness. There was a woman in a village who looked like his mother, and he married her. And We did not refrain from commenting on that, for a lament has no shame. There was a moment before he left on campaign when the woman who looked like his mother showed him twin babies, a boy and a girl. He could not breathe for the sweetness of their cheeks. And we sang that too. But it is hard to sing of sweetness with a harpy's mouth. We are made for rending. It is hard to simply weep. We must go and get it, the beak, and we may not steal it, but must sing the hoopoe's lament when it dies, and if its chicks deem the lament sufficient, they will give it over. In such a way, the hoopoe rationed the grief of the world. I was past 30 by the time I went to get my beak. Not a few of the others were unsure I would ever be ready to wear it. I'm sure you wonder at the hoopoe. Are these, are not, are these not tiny, colorful, but shallow and flittering birds? How could a beak like a dove's wishbone ever produce such funereal songs as I speak of? But I say to you that once there were great hoopoes, the likes of which you have never seen in these fallen days. Their rose orange wings were like those of an albatross, and their beaks were trumpets, and we were the wind blown through them. I went to the, into the mountains. I will not bore you with details of a quest. They're all much the same. One goes forth, one obtains, one returns. But when I found a huge old mother hoopoe dying in her nest, I crouched down among her flame-headed chicks, their feathers tipped in black and white speckles, to hear the life of the bird I would lament. She turned her old downy head to me, and this is what she said. The hoopoe's tail. My egg was hard to break. The yolk was golden and ropey. I opened my eyes in such brightness. My mother pierced her breast with her beak and fed me on her blood, which tasted like flying. She called me orange as the sun. The tide came in, the tide went out, I ate worms and beetles. I sang very loudly, and so did another hoopoe, whose tail was black and strong. I made a nest of hazel and down and bits of strange, sweet red wood that a raft builder had carelessly left behind. I laid three eggs that year and four the year after. I pierced my breast with my beak and fed them on my blood, which tasted like flying, too. I called them pink as a fat worm, and speckled as a shadow, and red as mother's blood, and other things. There were a lot of them. It's hard to remember. The year after I laid one, last year I laid five. So it goes. The tide came in. The tide went out. A hawk chased me once. She made a dent in my skull, and another in my beak. I clipped out one of her eyes. A cat mauled the hoopoe with the black tail, and my last eggs were from one with a blue crest. Now I'm old. I have no blood in me for more children. It was a good life. The mourner's tale continued. I held her old withered head in my hands like a brown apple, and her thirteen chicks gathered round, pink as a fat worm, and speckled as a shadow, and red as mother's blood, and also blue-bottomed as a jay, rosy as a burned farmer, sour as a hungry badger, all the rest. I raised up my head and sang of that 
diamond egg, the struggle to shatter it, the light of the morning sun on the shimmering yoke, the taste of mother's scarlet blood. I sang of the beauty of the black tail, the smoothness of infant eggs, the flow of, or of blood from oranges, the sun's breast, the sting and pain of her children's beaks at her breast. I sang the fright frightful, bitter-voiced hawk, and the great battle which lost the bird of prey, a precious eye. I sang of the wicked cat and the lost mate. I sang of new love with a blue crest. I sang of all those eggs, all that blood, and an empty chest singing out at the end of its days. I flew down the mountain with oranges, the sun's beak in my hand, slightly dented from the hawk fight. But the dent made the sweetest, most broken, sorrowful notes of any beak. I tied it onto my face and began my trade. Some years hence, I was approached by a clutch of women weeping like hoopos for their comrade, a corpse they carried on a bier made from the prow of a ship. She had white hair and a smile on her lips, and I listened well as they told me her life. I took the body to my accustomed place, hidden away in a forgotten and empty land by a little lake where I would not be disturbed for the years it would surely take to bring up this woman's lament from infancy. But they paid me well, those women. I settled into my task, combing the faded corpse for the tail. It smelled sweet, nothing at all like a corpse. Like roses and incense, much as you may mock me to hear such things said. I learned much from her slow rotting away to nothing, and though her body is gone, I am still fashioning her lament. Before it shivered away to dust, I happened to catch a glimpse of the great beer in the water, and to my surprise, the skeleton had the head of a decrepit old fox whose fur might once have been red. The tale of the dancing girl's descent continued. I stayed here for so long and for so many years that the other harpies forgot all about me. She drew aside the long folds of her cloak and beneath them I saw that her I saw her harpy body covered in brown feathers had grown entirely into the earth. There was now little difference between feathers and leaves, and her legs were gone altogether. She grew up out of the dirt like a stubby sapling. She chuckled and closed it again. I told you not to look. I've been here so long, the ground came up to greet me, and we've gotten along very well. I chew dirt like a shrub. The strained roots of this place ensure I have time to finish her lament. The long cloak grows like foliage, and my face has set into something like bark. But even in my work, even as the dirt came up to hear my lament in its youth, I began in my songs to catch wafts of other bodies from the cave, the beginnings of other laments that cried out to be raised properly. I understood, though slowly, for I have, have I not already said that I was a slow student, where I had made my nest. Once in a very long while, a folk interrupted my work on the fox girl's lament to ask passage into the cave. First, I told them, I hardly cared where they went. But as I guessed at the true shape of the cave, that it was something like a door, I thought it was only right that tolls be exacted. What sort of tolls? The harpy grinned. There is only one kind of toll the dead accept. Blood. It's always blood. The hoopo, the caselli, the stars. Pierce your breast with your beak and pour out your blood for the hungry. I moved my hand to my chest. What's in there? What is the Isle of the Dead? Who can say? I'm planted. I'm not dead. It is where the sky went to is it where the sky went to escape her children? Is it the underside of the sky? Is it just another country with other laws and customs? No one tells wept. She is just the keeper of the gate. Is that your name? Wept. I have done it all my days, but never once for myself. It is my name, it is my nature. I pulled my calf knife from its sheath. She pulled her bowl from the shadows. I paused and cut into the skin of my back, letting sap puddle in the metal pole, golden and thick as yolk. Wept raised her eyebrows and smiled widely, as a child will and shown a new thing. She pulled her cloak aside to let me pass and I felt her feathers on the wound as I went into the dark. The tale of the crossing continued. Yes, Seven breathed. I had only blood to give her, of course. 
She told me no tales, but I remember her face and the bowl. But why? he pleaded. Why did you leave me? I would never have left you. She looked at him with blank eyes. I stole a leaf, she said simply, and took his hand, leading him up and into the forest, far past the lapping sound of the lonely lake against the lonely shore. It was not a town, not exactly a village. It was certainly no city, but there were houses, low and gray and slick things, slick with old rain, as though someone had once lived there long ago. It was very dark on this part of the island, and there were pricks of light in the mire, almost, though not entirely, like stars. One of them spun very quickly, faster and faster, until a woman seemed to step out of it. She was flushed with color, all the color that the forest might have had, nearly too vivid to look at. Her skin was like a snake's, scaled and thick and screaming, a screaming, writhing green, shot with black and blue and scarlet. Most of her undulated serpentine and boneless, her torso longer and more flexible than a woman's ought to be. She wore yellow veils that whipped and snapped at her heels, but covered nothing in particular, not least her green skin, which showed dark and shining through the golden cloth. Her hair was long and black and glassy, and the bangles around her arms were jeweled in a hundred kinds of agate. Her eyes were black as the bottom of a well, and her blue-black blue fingers were long and grasping. Her legs were clamped together as though by sheer hope they might squeeze into a tail, but they stayed stubbornly separate. She was pregnant, her verdant belly sloping out of her veils like Fumim's diamond. I brought her the leaf, said Oubliette, by way of explanation that Seven did not at all understand. Immaculata's leaf. I danced her for so many years. I loved her. I didn't want her to be alone. I owed it to her to both of them, to find the cave and the lake, to cut off my tail. We are not unhappy here together. I am not alone, the woman said, her voice, her voice throaty and deep, echoing through the wood. No one will let me alone. And here we have a wonderful illustration. That is where we will end up. We will end it for the week. Uh, and we will begin with the tale of the leaf and the snake uh, on Sunday night. So not quite week. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, the dreamer says it's kind of a repeating phrase there. It reminds of the tooth creature from Barrow. It's a lot of repeating phrases because that's what fairy tales do. They're all about... Um, Repetition, of course, because the storytellers needed to remember the stories. So um, that's uh, that's what writers do. They take a necessity and make it fancy. So um, these stories are, are full of repetition. Um, the absentia in the box is a, the, the testicles in a box is a real thing. It's a, it, the, from the um, Chinese eunuch bureaucracy. Uh, they would carry theirs in little boxes. Um, the, the, I think I talked a little bit before about uh, the story of Seven and Oubliette coming from sort of Hansel and Gretel in a, in a way, and the line, there are some things you don't get over, is it's just something I think about a lot with fairy tales, and that was kind of what I was looking to play out with their story, that, that some fairy tales are so traumatic that you can just never really be normal again um, after them. Uh, the translation motif, if that's the word coming forward more in the second book. Yeah, um, there, there's definitely a, a lot of, of metamorphosis like that. And um, apparently just infinite birds, <laughs> infinite bird regression. Um, man, apparently I really dig birds. <laughs> but oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, death being a translation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think some of that actually, the back of my head said some of, says that some of that comes from... Um, Derrida's essay on uh, translation, which is called The Tower of Babel, and it's insufferably pretentious to say, oh, it's inspired by Derrida. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, Derrida's a really good writer, um, and he he wrote on countless subjects. Like, most people sort of don't think about that, just think of deconstruction and postmodernism. And of course, most of his work 
is postmodern, uh, but he wrote a lot about translation because um, he worked as a translator and it's, it's very interesting stuff. Um, so uh, I was very much in that uh, when I was writing this as I was finishing up the end of the graduate school that I dropped out of. Um, cool. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I don't even necessarily know where I'm going with that, but I, I do know that um, I, I, uh, I have come to feel at peace with my uh, good dead friend Jacques, uh, who I hated in my critical theory class, but now now I, 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 I do have my love for. Uh, yeah. I liked having the little Hoopo story, which is just a normal story of a normal bird life. Um, but I don't know what my deal was. <laughs> I just couldn't quit it with the birds. I mean, part of it is, is definitely that like the medieval bestiaries are bird heavy. Uh, like the thing about the hoopoe um, cutting its own breast and feeding its children on its blood, that is not a real thing in real life. That is a thing from a medieval bestiary. Um, hoopoes represent good parents in all of medieval iconography uh, because um, the, that was the idea that the, the hoopo um, would would cut itself and its children would like little vampire birds uh, would feed on its blood and that this is apparently the model for parenthood um, and I've always found that so interesting that this is a real it's an absolutely real bird there really are hoopos in the world and uh, this is not a thing they do uh, I mean I'm sure that they they regurgitate the way uh, any bird does for its young but that was taken by medieval scholars and turned into this metaphor for, for not just motherhood, but, but fatherhood too, and um, parental sacrifice. But there's a lot of real animals in medieval bestiaries that do things that real animals don't do. Their whole ideas about what bears were like, um, that's in Palimpsest, uh, that bears are born completely like unformed lumps of flesh and their, their mothers lick them into bears. <laughs> um, so that's not a thing. Uh, but I suppose it looks like, kind of, sort of looks like a thing, because they're born squirmy. But bears aren't really. They're not, they're not born like little kittens. They're, they're, they're a little more further along than that. Um, but I love bestiaries. Uh, so I'm sure that some of the bird stuff comes from uh, bestiaries being so, so uh, <laughs> uh, top heavy with birds. Uh, and fairy tales love birds too. Uh, but boy, I really can't account for just the sheer percentage of birds in this book. <laughs> Not really sure what all of that is all about. I saw uh, SJ just signed on and she's the one who first sort of noticed that there's a lot of birds. Uh, but I don't know. I am what I am. Um, so yeah. Well, I'll do my outro and if you have questions, you can ask during it and I will pop back into them. Um, as always. This is for legal reasons, not an audiobook. It is a play. Cool. Uh, <laughs> you can find music based on these books at sjtucker.com. You can buy copies of them at your local independent bookseller's web portal. You can find me on Twitter at Cat Valenti. Uh, you can subscribe to my Patreon at Cat Valenti. And you can catch up in the archive anytime at Cat Valenti Live on YouTube uh, or by just clicking my big dumb face on my Instagram profile. Uh, <laughs> you, if you like, can toss a coin to your witch and uh, put something in the tip jar, which is on my Instagram profile, my YouTube profile, or my website at katherineambulanti.com. You don't have to, but uh, times are very tight, so anything that you can give will be deeply, deeply appreciated by this entire household, uh, and I will thank you by name on the next stream. Is the cave the same one visited by Knife in the first book? You know what? I'm actually, I don't think I've thought of that. Let's say yes. Let's say that I meant that. Um, maybe in the, maybe this happened a couple of times where I've been reading along and been like, oh, it'd be cool if that connected. I don't think I did that. And then I find, I read a couple more pages and said, no, nah, I did connect it up. Um, that is a, definitely a Sigrid uh, the, there uh, having her final cameo uh, being lamented by the harpy. Um, yeah, uh, so let's pretend that it definitely is Knife's Cave. Um, what's a book from my personal canon? Little Big is uh, one of my favorite books ever. Um, it's just, it's to me, it's a perfect book from start to finish. Many people do not believe it is a perfect book. Many people believe it is excruciatingly boring for the first hundred pages or so. They are wrong and bad. Uh, 
but I do take comfort in that um, because like people say garbage things about my books all the time. But if like people can groan about Little Big, something I think is just so luminous, uh, then 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 fine. People can say whatever they want about my books. Um, oh, but somebody asked earlier what my best read was this year. Um, so right now I'm, I'm in the middle of reading A Peculiar Peril, which is Jeff Vandermeer's new YA book. And it's um, it's it's delightfully structured. Uh, I haven't finished it yet, so I can't fully judge, but I'm really enjoying it so far. Um, and I read Hank Green's A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor a little earlier this year, and that was really awesome. Um, yeah, but I haven't read a lot this year because I've been writing a lot. Uh, so the, I, this is, I've probably only read four or five books this year, so uh, it, it's, it, it's not a gigantic contest uh, between giants, but these are still very good books. Um, See? Couldn't get through it. Uh, <laughs> but it's okay. Little Big's great. Uh, I think it's great. Um, you don't have to think it's great. That's fine. I also, uh, to pick a sort of less well-known one, not that Little Big is like some kind of crazy bestseller, um, though it was it used to be, I think, more beloved than it is now. Uh, I love Momo by Michael End, which has come up in recent Twitter conversations. Um, hardly anybody in the U.S. knows it, though it's very beloved in Germany. Michael End, you may or may not know, uh, is the author of The NeverEnding Story. Well, he wrote this other YA book, or middle grade maybe, um, about a little girl named Momo, and I don't even want to tell you any more than that. It's totally, incredibly awesome, and actually I think quite uh, apropos for the moment we're in, so I recommend everyone go get a copy of Momo and read it. Um, yeah, okay, well, I will see you all Sunday night, same fairy tale time, same fairy tale channel. Um, wear your masks. I know that all of you would wear your masks, and I, I have faith in you, even if I don't have faith in anybody else. Um, cheers. Uh, here's to your mango stuff uh, as well, and uh, I will see you on the internets. Bye, guys. <laughs>